Welcome to our last AI talk of 2023. My name is Aida Ponce del Castillo, and I am your host today. We will discuss with Tim Christians, and uh, welcome, Tim. Dr. Tim Christians is Assistant Professor of Economics, Ethics at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. His research focuses on the intersection between critical social theory and economic topics like digitalization of work, neoliberalism, and financialization. Tim has published two amazing books on the digital economy, uh, one in English, Digital Working Lives, just last year, 2022, and a recent one published this year, The Kluse Economie for Outputting Click and Bar in Netherlands, in, published this year. And uh, Tim, welcome very much to our AI Talks uh, of ETUI. Let's kick our, start our session with your words and your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and for your uh, introduction. In the meantime, I'll share my slides. And they should be visible right now. So my original plan was to uh, talk a bit about uh, my my book, more specifically the, the the Dutch version and the kind of political stakes that I delineate in that book. But then last week, the European Union uh, came to an agreement on the Platform Work Directive, and so I uh, completely changed gears and uh, uh, um, prepared a new uh, talk. So the whole process started in 2021 with the European Commission delivering a proposal for regulating the gig economy and platform work uh, in a new fashion. And now two years later, it has actually come to an agreement. And so the question is now what will be the effects or the outcomes of that agreement? And as of yet, a lot of that is still rather unclear. Uh, I have not had a, a, a sneak peek or anything like that at the actual text. Uh, for that, we will have to wait. So uh, I already uh, apologize in advance for some speculation. Uh, um, but um, we'll see how far we will get. Now, here you can actually see those two books uh, that, that, that Aida already mentioned. Uh, so. What I plan to do for this talk is first to give a kind of contextual overview, labor platforms, and more specifically, how we should approach them, how we should interpret them, namely through the lens of what I call digital tailorism. Then I'll move on to this platform work directive and its effects. And uh, then I'll move to my own political proposal, uh, which goes along the lines of platform cooperativism. So, if we look at the news about labor platforms nowadays, and especially this last uh, this last week, the main discussion or the main topic of debate concerns this question, are platform workers employees or self-employed independent contractors? And so that's been a topic of contestation for yeah, as long as these labor platforms nowadays exist. And so both when we talk about Uber or Deliveroo or Airbnb or Amazon Mechanical Turk or any of these other platforms, the same discussion seems to reappear in all those, those sectors. And 
from the legal perspective, it's obviously very clear why this kind of question would come up. If workers are employees, then that means that they have access to certain labor rights that they don't have as independent contractors, uh, certain social protections, uh, bargaining rights, etc. And yet, there are particular problems or challenges for this legal perspective. The first challenge I listed is that employment status, specifically as it has given shape in what's called the global north, is very much rooted in a particular historical context, named the context of Fordism, as in the kind of arrangement of the labor market where there's a social compromise between labor and capital, where on the one hand, uh, capital grants labor particular social rights, particular social protections, uh, political representation in the form of uh, union representation, for instance. And in exchange for that, workers give, uh, say, high productivity to capital. Uh, um, in originally the, the context of forced factories of mass production, mass consumption. But what we've seen is that since then, the labor market and the economy has kind of moved away from this model, where there is a clear opposition between labor and capital with a clear compromise, a clear agreement on, on the one hand as social peace, labor rights, high wages, and on the other hand, um, um, high productivity. So, this is uh, on the way out, so to speak. Uh, on the one hand, because it's had its own downsides. Uh, so the reason why this compromise could function, for instance, is because it was very often, say, the male white worker who was receiving those high wages, who was protected by labor unions. Whereas, for instance, uh, his wife uh, would very often stay at home, uh, perform housework that was unwaged and that did not grant access to the same kind of rights. Also, the system was very much dependent on a colonial system in which other countries were delivering cheap resources through which this dynamic could be sustained. And so once these colonial territories uh, become independent, uh, these same bargains are no longer possible. So on the one hand, there are these downsides, and then on the other hand, you notice that both capital and labor also seem to move away from this agreement in the 1970s, let's say. Depends a bit on the country. And so on the side of labor, you see that there are uprisings of workers uh, or uh, movements of workers that want uh, more authenticity, more autonomy in their work. And they don't want to uh, do the kind of monotonous factory job uh, that uh, in a Fordist uh, labor relations are required. Uh, so you see this move towards more individualized uh, labor relations. On the side of capital, on the other hand, you notice that capital no longer finds it profitable to invest in these industrial mass production uh, schemes anymore. Rather, they move their factories to low-cost countries while uh, in Western countries and investing in uh, a, a knowledge economy instead. So you see this move away from the social compromise. Then on the other hand, another problem for the legal perspective, for platform workers specifically, uh, is that there's a stark contrast between what I've called the perspective of the worker in a kind of abstract uh, sense, and the actual concrete workers and their own aspirations. So if we, from the outside, look at platform work, we notice that indeed workers would very much be served with uh, the kind of social rights that employment status would grant them. And yet, if you uh, look at interviews with workers themselves, and platform companies always like to show this or like to, to, to point this out, uh, quite a lot of workers are not necessarily interested in official employment status. There are a number of reasons for that. Uh, so you have quite a lot of workers who buy into the entrepreneurial identity 
that uh, platform companies present. Uh, so when they go out looking for workers, they don't promise employment and employee rights. Rather, they say something along the lines of uh, in doers we trust. Or if you want to work for yourself and not have a boss, uh, come work with us. Uh, and always can kind of crucial platform companies use the term working with us instead of working for us. Because indeed they want to claim that they are a partner of the individual worker rather than their official employer. And so quite a lot of workers buy into this uh, narrative because it also grants them a certain, a say, view of the future. In the sense of even if now, if I work as an, as an Uber driver, even if today I'm not earning enough money to sustain myself, I know that if I put in the work, then eventually I will become a successful entrepreneur. And there's this promise of autonomy that is very attractive to lots of workers as well. And one of the reasons why you notice that when it comes to protests for employment status, that quite often the platform workers themselves are absent at these protests. And then added to that, there are also some genuine fears or that uh, platform workers might have if, for instance, Uber becomes their official employer. Uh, already nowadays, every few weeks or every few months, you can read in the newspapers about some scandal uh, with one of these platform companies. And that is uh, under the assumption that they are not employers and do not have the same kind of authority that an official employer has over their workers. And so quite a lot of workers fear that if platform companies would become their official employers, they could be even more demanding than they are now, uh, granting even fewer freedoms than uh, uh, those apps deliver at the moment. Because at the moment, I mean, the flexibility and the kind of individual freedoms that uh, platforms uh, get, grant their workers are somewhat limited. But of course, once they would become official employers, they would be limited even more. And so hence why there's quite a lot of platform workers who do not want to uh, access employment status necessarily. So basically where I start both of, both of these books is then with the claim that instead of immediately focusing on this legal perspective and then ending up in this uh, kind of infinite battle of well, whether or not uh, uh, platform workers are employees or independent contractors, uh, and trying to make some kind of fixed line separating the two. I argue, well, we can take a kind of deviation through a more sociological lens, where instead of trying to regulate this in advance, we say, no, first we're going to study how does the platform economy actually work? Uh, um, how does the gig economy, how are power relations between uh, the quasi-employer and quasi-employee, uh, how are these power relations at play? What's the kind of dynamic here? Because we'll see that there's actually kind of a gray zone in between traditional employment and kind of fully entrepreneurial self-employed status. In reality, you notice, depending on which platform you look at, workers will be somewhere along this spectrum. Uh, if we look at an Uber driver, they will be closer to what we would traditionally see as an employee. They don't have that much power to autonomously organize their own work. Whereas if you move towards, for instance, the Airbnb host, they have far more autonomy in how to organize their work. So they would probably be more on the side of the self-employed entrepreneur. So I would say uh, for the moment we bracket the discussion where to put the exact border between both sides. And instead we look at these kind of myriad of very divergent, very different power relations at play. And where we see that uh, the reality is more fine grained than uh, original labor law or traditional labor law allows uh, us to say. And so how can we then 
theorize about these, these power relations. For that, I turn to a classic, uh, Marx's Capital, Volume 1. Uh, so uh, Aida already said it, I'm a philosopher by training. Uh, so originally, we have been trained to study up our, on our classics. And one of those classics is Capital, Volume 1. And there you can find a quote where Marx says, it would be possible to write quite a history of the inventions made since 1830 for the sole purpose of supplying capital with weapons against the revolts of the working class. So Marx presents here a very particular philosophy of technology. He says, well, technology is not some kind of neutral medium uh, through which we establish or, or support economic growth. No, it is a weapon. It is an instrument in a struggle for power. In the workplace, uh, you have on the one hand capital trying to control the workforce, and on the other hand, the working class trying to establish its own autonomy. And so technology is an instrument in that struggle. And you can, of course, uh, Marx was thinking about industrial machinery, assembly line production, these kind of things. Where indeed you can see that what, for instance, the assembly line does is take away autonomy from highly skilled artisanal workers, such that workers can be de-skilled and hence more easily replaced by uh, by others, uh, more I say more obedient workers. And once you have this assembly line in place, you also allow management to determine how the labor process is coordinated. Uh, you can do that kind of in advance by setting up how the assembly line is organized and also determining the speed of production. Uh, it's management that determines how fast this assembly line actually operates. Uh, so you grant more power than to management through these techniques. And so we can study algorithmic management in a similar fashion. What these algorithms do is on the one hand, grant workers some form of autonomy uh, flexible scheduling, uh, uh, the, the freedom to choose or accept or, 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 or reject tasks that are located to them through an app. Uh, so you give them certain uh, freedoms. And yet, on the other hand, you give them those freedoms in a context in which uh, you can still make sure that workers do what the platform demands uh, or wants these workers to do. Uh, so that, let's say, the coordination of the labor process is still centrally organized. Uh, for those who are uh, big fans of Harry Braverman, uh, he calls that uh, the separation of the moments of conception and execution. The moment of conception, the moment where you plan how to coordinate the labor process, should be separated from the workers actually executing those plans. And so algorithmic management is one way to allow for that. Uh, because what you do is you allow workers some freedom to determine how they're going to do their job. And yet, through those algorithms, by allocating tasks through opaque uh, um, uh, software decisions, you can still kind of retake some control over their labor. Uh, quite often, that's through what we call ex post surveillance. Uh, so you're not going to monitor their work while they're doing it. But afterwards, they get, for instance, a rating from consumers, uh, one to five stars or something like that. Uh, or uh, Deliveroo, for instance, tracks uh, their, their delivery speed. Uh, or or um, uh, Uber, for instance, measures uh, the braking speed of uh, Uber drivers. Uh, so whether uh, you, uh, as a driver, smoothly brake uh, or smoothly slow the car so that it's more comfortable for the consumer or not. And so you measure all those things. And then afterwards, you let task allocation depend on a rating or a ranking based on those calculations. So in that way, you can still exercise control over the workforce. Now, in them both books, I go into, let's say, more detail about uh, what kind of effects these forms of algorithmic management have. In both cases, I study first and uh, the opportunities for exploitation that this uh, delivers. Uh, then I look into 
ratings, customer ratings, and uh, reputation systems, and how that creates forms of alienation. And then lastly, I look into how uh, the workforce is exhausted in the sense of how uh, more energy is demanded of workers and that they can actually physically or mentally deliver. So if you're interested in that, you can uh, read those in those books, but uh, to stay within the proper amount of time, I, I'm going to skip this because I want to go to this platform work directive. Uh, it's kind of a historic moment that last week uh, we have had this decision and at least from the messaging that we've now received, some of the preliminary fears and criticisms seem responded to, seem abated. Uh, so uh, uh, Aida has written some uh, uh, criticisms or, or warnings in advance. I have done so as well uh, about, uh, because we thought this wasn't moving in the right direction, especially the, uh, the Council of Ministers had quite severely diminished the protections that were in the document for platform workers. So now that those protections seem to be there, we can say that this is a preliminary victory. Uh, so that uh, workers' rights seem to be more protected with this directive. But one thing to notice is that uh, online labor platforms, Amazon Mechanical Turk and these kind of things, seem not to be included. Uh, or that's at least what I've heard. But what it does regulate is, for instance, employment status by saying that there is a presumption of employment if two out of five indicators apply. Uh, so make a list of five indicators. If workers apply for two of them, or at least two of them, they are employees. And member states can add more indicators but uh, this two out of five is a kind of baseline. So they can add more indicators saying two out of six or two out of seven, uh, but uh, not as the um, Council of Ministers had suggested three out of seven, which would have made it easier for platform companies to evade employment status. A second thing that the Platform Work Directive regulates is algorithmic management. And so Platforms need to be a lot more transparent about how workers are ranked, how they are monitored uh, by these platforms. Uh, so this has to be more uh, out in the open. And there need to be forms of human oversight in place. Uh, so one of the discussions here is about robo-firing. Uh, so can platform workers be automatically fired uh, by an algorithm without some kind of human in the loop, so to speak? And so it seems to suggest that there should be a human belief. And that also not all forms of data, of personal data, is allowed to be captured and used in these um, monitoring systems. Now, the exact details will have to wait uh, once we actually see the, the, the real text. And then the last thing uh, that was uh, claimed is that the use of intermediaries would not absolve platform companies from their obligations. And so quite a lot of platform companies evade regulation by not hiring platform workers directly, but rather moving through a subsidiary. And then the subsidiary hires the workers and they, and they have a contract with the subsidiary uh, to avoid regulation. So that would be avoided as well. And so the question is then, now what? And so what brings the future? And so now the member states have two years to translate this uh, directive into national law. But there are some, some potential dangers. Um, one thing is that uh, so the Council and the European Parliament still needs to approve of this agreement. And the European Parliament doesn't seem to object. Uh, but uh, what we can kind of read online uh, uh, I only have indirect uh, sources of information, so I don't have any hot takes here. Uh, but uh, the council, there seem to be some member states who object to the current formulation of the directive. So this might still prove problematic. And also, uh, member states can make alterations. And sometimes it's in the it's in it's uh, kind of the devil is in the details. Uh, once it comes to regulation, uh, you need to make sure how member states exactly 
formulate certain laws and to see whether platform companies can evade regulation or not. And then lastly, even if you have, say, the ideal legal system, then still a lot depends on enforceability. Uh, can you actually enforce the law? And so, for instance, I'm originally from Belgium. Uh, so in Belgium, we already have uh, the so-called labor deal from last year. And uh, in that deal was also regulated uh, employment status for gig workers. But we noticed that platform companies have not actually changed or reclassified their workers. And one of the issues there is that the labor inspectorate does not really have proper resources to actually enforce or to monitor compliance with the law. Uh, and um, the European Trade Union Confederate, Confederation has already uh, point out, pointed out as well that in quite a lot of member states, labor inspectorates have fewer and fewer staff to actually monitor uh, compliance with the law. Uh, so this is another issue. Uh, will the law actually be enforced? Another issue to look at is how do platform companies themselves react? And as of yet, seems to be no problem. Uh, so Paolo Gamino, uh, the representative of Uber, uh, went on the record to say, uh, we remain committed to Europe. We're not going to leave. Uh, so it seems like they want to comply. But there is a risk also of willful non-compliance uh, where platform companies explicitly or at least voluntarily uh, ignore the law. Uh, so there's a case here of Glovo in Spain. Uh, in Spain, you also had uh, a, a law, a rider's law. And uh, Glovo has, as of yet, not really changed its policy towards workers. And so fines keep stacking up, but as of yet, they haven't paid yet. Uh, so uh, that's another issue. Uh, will uh, companies actually comply? And then the last issue, the one I would like to focus on here, is the risk of market withdrawal. Uh, it might be that platform companies argue, well, but under these conditions, it is just not profitable for us to operate in the European Union, and hence we will just leave the market. Uh, as of yet, companies have not yet said this, but for instance, just before uh, there was this agreement, uh, Uber warned in uh, the Financial Times that uh, with employment status, prices would move up, uh, would be more expensive for consumers to book an Uber, to uh, order food via Deliveroo, etc. And so demand would go down meaning that quite a lot of workers would be out of work. Uh, that's and the prediction that Uber made. And you can uh, say, if you make it uh, even more pessimistic, you can say, well, quite a lot of these platform companies are financially speaking quite fragile. Uh, Uber, for instance, has first reported profits uh, last summer. Uh, so up until last summer, Uber never made any real profits. Uh, only now is it a profitable business. Uh, with Deliveroo or, or some of these other companies as well, profitability is a major obstacle. So it might be that if prices rise and consumer demand goes down, then, then these companies will no longer be able to uh, have profitable prospects uh, or, let's say, um, healthy financial prospects. Uh, if labor costs move up substantially, might be that uh, when they look at the books, when they look at the accounts, that uh, some of these companies will go out of business or simply leave. Uh, so hence, uh, the um, European Commissioner for uh, Employment, Nicola Schmidt, uh, he, he went on the record in an interview to say, well, but consumers will be very willing to pay these higher prices if it means that platform workers are better protected. I'm not necessarily so sure, and I have my reasons for not being so sure. For instance, if we look at Deliveroo in the Netherlands, see, Deliveroo left, I think, last year, uh, already two years ago, sorry. 
Uh, two years ago, they left in response to a court case where the judge decided that delivery couriers should be classified as employees. And so Deliveroo mentioned, well, uh, due to raising uh, labor costs, due to employment status, but also due to uh, raising prices because there was uh, inflation, and especially inflation in food prices, we see that consumers are ordering less and less food online, and so we simply cannot remain profitable in the Netherlands. And so we move out. Uh, similar stuff happens in other countries as well. Uh, so Getty, who is a kind of similar platform, uh, uh, has left Spain when this rider's law was um, implemented. Uh, and another uh, case uh, where uh, we've had some discussion about was Helpling, which is a domestic uh, labor platform. Uh, so for domestic help, so, or mainly uh, cleaning services and these kind of things, where uh, workers were reclassified, not as employees, but as a kind of temp worker. In Dutch, you say uitzendkrachten. Not sure what the proper English translation for that is. But, and so Helpling also said, well, we, we cannot afford uh, these labor costs, so we have to file for bankruptcy. And so we see that indeed quite a lot of these platform companies are financially vulnerable to raising labor costs. And we shouldn't be uh, simply dismissive of those risks. So the move towards traditional labor rights has its own risks. And these kind of unintended side effects, what if a platform simply goes bankrupt? And what will happen to those workers then? Uh, because it doesn't mean uh, if, if one of these companies goes bankrupt, doesn't immediately create better jobs for these workers elsewhere. And uh, so quite often what happens is that they simply move to other sectors of the informal economy uh, or move into unemployment, which does not necessarily benefit them very much. And uh, so these kind of unintended, unintended side effects is an issue. And another issue is that basically what uh, this employment status delivers is what uh, philosopher Philip Pettit calls it anti-power. As in, you have the power of an employer, and then uh, employees kind of gather together through trade unions, for instance, uh, as a kind of anti-power, as a kind of response to power, such that they can start negotiating, so they are bargaining for better working conditions. But the question is whether we shouldn't aim a bit higher. Because if we look at how these platform companies work, what, how they operate, to a large extent, what they use is data from their users. And so if you look at the, the market valuation of a company like Uber or so, this market valuation does not come from the kind of commissions that they extract from transactions on their platform. And so with every transaction, if I book an Uber, uh, part of the money I pay goes to Uber itself. But that doesn't determine the value of Uber on financial markets. Rather, what determines it is the kind of database it gathers about its users. It's this database that uh, is the source of its value. But if all this comes from the kind of data labor that we as individuals have produced, shouldn't we then have more of a say in that company? Uh, rather than having simply a seat at the table to negotiate, Shouldn't we be in control of those databases directly? And so hence uh, why I argue for a kind of plan B, where I say, well, employment status is good. Uh, so I agree with uh, the platform work directive to regulate uh, employment status. But to avoid these unintended side effects and to add opportunities for direct self-management for these workers, we need a kind of safety net. Uh, once a uh, helpling or delivery goes bankrupt or moves out, where do these workers move to? And so my claim or my proposal is there. For that, you need to invest in cooperative labor platforms. Uh, so these are platforms that offer the same services as Uber or Deliveroo or uh, any of these traditional platform companies, but they are managed by workers directly by workers themselves. And they can function as a kind of plan B then.
And so I made a list here of a couple of these companies. So for instance, you have Coop Cycle, which is a federation of cooperatives that um, do uh, kind of food delivery along the lines of Deliveroo or Gatier or one of these companies. And so I think for instance in Brussels, where ETUI is located, there's Molen Bike, uh, which uh, is part of Coop Cycle. And so it also delivers food. In the Netherlands, uh, there's uh, a similar uh, cooperative there. It's called Bestellen Bij. And as a matter of fact, Bestellen Bij is quite interesting in that it was founded at the moment that Deliveroo left. So once Deliveroo left the market, there was a kind of vacuum. And in this vacuum, a couple of ex-Deliveroo couriers uh, kind of uh, organized and created a new cooperative that offers the same services and could kind of step, up, step in in this vacuum. Another case is uh, Stocksy United, uh, which is a cooperative for uh, stock photo uh, photographers. Uh, another Belgian case, Smart, uh, where freelancers can, can cooperate together. And we have a, lots of different cases as well. But so the idea is there to organize or to have a kind of institutional form that supports collective ownership and governance of these platforms. And of course, your immediate question uh, will be, but how can these cooperative platforms ever compete with these big Silicon Valley uh, corporations? And because indeed direct competition will not work with these kind of companies. Uh, a company like Uber can strategically underprice its services. And uh, so offer prices lower than what they actually cost to deliver because they get so much funding from investors. And so if you want to compete with that, that's simply impossible. And that's how the say, traditional taxi companies were put out of business by companies like Uber. So direct competition does not seem to work. But so my proposal is something that I call diachronic competition. And so synchronic competition is competition at the same time, at exactly the same moment, and that will not work. But diachronic competition is that you bank on the financial vulnerability of these platforms, say that, well, there are cases in which platform companies have to withdraw from the market or will become bankrupt, and then you can replace them, uh, like in the case with Deliveroo and Bestel and Bear. Uh, so once Deliveroo moves out, Bestel and Bear as a cooperative could replace it. And so that system can work if uh, the proper regulatory framework is put in place. Uh, that means on the one hand, government regulation that indeed disincentivizes these gig economy uh, unethical platform companies and incentivizes cooperatives instead. And also an investment portfolio at the governmental level that supports these uh, cooperatives. Uh, so I call that venture socialism uh, as a kind of counterpart to venture capitalism. And you see this, for instance, often happening on a municipal level. One case there is Austin in the United States, where Uber and Lyft had a regulatory dispute with the municipal government. And so they threatened to leave. They did. But Austin or the municipal government had kind of anticipated on that and had already invested in a cooperative and a non-profit platform to offer the same ride hailing services. And so people, both workers and consumers, relatively easily move to these other platforms. And hence Uber and Lyft were not really missed. And so here you can see kind of a system in which competition with uh, these um, traditional platforms can actually work. And so that will be uh, my proposal. So, to sum up, first claim, the digital Taylorism approach offers a helpful lens specifically to capture very different power relations in the gig economy. Secondly, this platform work directive is a political victory, but there are certain risks on the horizon. And then thirdly, platform cooperativism can, can offer a plan B kind of safety net for when those platform companies in one way or another fail. And so on that note, I thank you for your attention. I think Aidan has some questions.
Of course, Tim, thanks to you for this very clear uh, thought presentation and thoughts. And before people start or continue writing their questions here on the chat, on the Q&A box, I will ask you a couple of questions myself. So as you said, this uh, platform work directive looks like a victory, a political victory for yeah. many, many reasons. Yeah. So what do you think, uh, um, do you think that this new directive imp could impact platform workers outside the EU? And if any, what type of impact do you think could be envisaged? Um, let's say my, I was originally trained uh, say, uh, as a philosopher and political scientist. And from that, I still remember again the term normative power Europe. Uh, so the European Union likes to present itself in international relations as a normative power. Uh, so that it, can, it presents a moral exemplar to the rest of the world. And so and you can see that really happening in the case of um, any form of AI regulation, uh, platform work now, Digital Services Act, etc. that the European Union likes to present itself as the kind of ethical alternative to specifically the United States and China. But on the other hand, uh, so that's, I mean, that's the, the self-presentation. But on the other hand, will this actually work? <laughs> that's another matter in the sense that you see in lots of different parts of the world, the gig economy moving in a different direction. And so, for instance, in the United States, you had, that's now one or two years ago, Proposition 22 in California, which was a referendum on, among others, the uh, employment status of um, gig workers. And in that referendum, uh, the uh, self-employed status position one and uh, so you can see depending on the country uh, quite a lot of countries moving in in the opposite direction from the uh, european union so i would say that whether or not the platform work directive can actually have an impact in the rest of the world would to a large extent depend on the dynamics in those other parts of the world right and yeah. continuing with the impact of the political yeah. agreement, I would like to pull out a question for from the audience. What is your assessment regarding the chances of this political agreement getting confirmed by the Council, given that the Spanish presidency probably overstepped their mandate in their negotiations concluding on December 13? Yeah. And I mean, I must say also when, when I saw okay, what was decided in the eventual platform work directive, I was quite surprised because indeed uh, the council went in a completely different direction from what was, what was uh, eventually decided. So I was also puzzled by that. To be honest, I don't have, say, the full response here because I don't have any kind of direct contact to people actually negotiating it in the, in the council. It seems indirectly then that there is quite some opposition. And then the question is whether that opposition will really take shape in the form of rejecting the directive or just kind of amending it or in one way or another and giving it a very particular interpretation. Uh, hence why, I mean, I was also a bit surprised by some term switching, uh, criteria becoming indicators and these right. kinds of things. Mm. So uh, uh, um, a lot will depend here on what those terms will exactly turn out to mean. And regarding the risks, what could happen if there is no platform work directive? Well, um, then we basically stay with, as it is right now in that with every court case that comes before a judge, it will be up for grabs what will be the eventual outcome. Uh, so for instance, in the case of employment status, you can see that uh, in different countries, even within the same country, but different judges can come to very different answers to that question and so my guess is that to some extent this would then continue uh, by the way even i think with the platform work directive that risk is still there and uh, because how those criteria or indicators i should say are exactly interpreted will also to some extent depend on uh, judicial interpretation Let's go a little bit to the to the content of of this of the of the with the elements that this platform work directive has. There is a question of Olgu Ozdemir 
who asks, do you think that the right to transparency and the limitation of the data types mm -hmm. it's going to be regulated in platform work directive can lead to reasonable inferences of the platform worker or do we need something more than that? Um, to some extent, yes. So basically I would say that, um, so transparency is at least, it, it's a kind of necessary condition for all the rest to happen, but it's not a sufficient condition. It's not because uh, platforms are transparent about how they rank their workers, uh, what kind of data they keep from their workers about their workers, and that uh, they're actually able, or that workers are actually able to contest this. That requires another step. Uh, so that requires uh, the proper institutional forms for that, uh, things like social bargaining channels and uh, or consulta um, contestation mechanisms. Um, so that will be the next step. But if you want that to work, you will need also some form of transparency. You need to know what data is being kept about workers and how it is used before you can contest it. And so you already have initiatives like that. In the UK, there is the Worker Info Exchange, for instance, where they do exactly that. They keep track of data that specifically Uber keeps about their workers in order to be able to contest it. Uh, but so I would say it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. And also on the directive, on the first part of it, is, which is the presumption of employment, uh, could the presumption of employment uh, as how it is written now in, mm -hmm. in the directive apply to task rabbit or similar workers? Depends. Uh, I mean, like, like, like I previously said, like, so this will very much be up for judicial interpretation. The way in which it seems to be written right now, though again, I've only I, I have only indirect information, so it might be mistaken here. It seems that quite a lot of platform work would constitute employment, and so that would be relatively easy. Task rabbit might be uh, more difficult because there there's really quite a lot of freedom for the individual worker to determine who they're going to work for, how tasks are located, and so. Task rabbit would be more, let's say, on my what well, I previously started with the spectrum between employment and, and self-employment. Task rabbit is more on the side of self-employment. But where the line is exactly drawn will to a very large extent still depend on judges. I'm still speaking about drawing lines and who is in and out. For example, is there a risk that companies will be able to define themselves out as not platforms? So other type of companies, and then loopholing themselves out of the scope of this platform yeah. work directive. Yeah, to some extent, then we would have to look at the exact definition of platform there is there. Uh, I know there was, oh, I don't remember who wrote this. Uh, there was on the, uh, uh, on the internet, on Verfassungsblock, which is a German website for uh, labor law. And, 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 yeah, we type it right, yes. Uh, so, and in the summer, there was a, a special issue or kind of special issue on, on the platform work directive. And one of the contributions was exactly about that. Uh, so about the definition of platform and whether or not uh, a company would count as a platform company. To be honest, I don't. I, I would have to read it again to know exactly what's written there. So I'm not gonna make any definitive statements here, but I agree that it could be a risk depending on the exact definition. Okay, Tim, and perhaps a more philosophical question or sociological question from Martin Aretz, yeah. uh, who asks, most research and discussion on gig economy is from the Western EU, basically, he says, and the US perspective. And when it is outside of the Western context, it is still, in many cases, from a standpoint from Western mm -hmm. kind of values, if you like. Yes. So do you think that mm -hmm. the Fordist and colonial labor relations approach is the reason for this? Um, uh, first of all, hi, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a very good question. In the sense that what you notice is that once you start looking at other parts of the globe, that this history part that I started with becomes very different. Why so? Because I, in, in, let's say, the global north, 
we move from traditional labor relations in this Fordist model towards a gig economy. Whereas in quite a lot of other countries, you move from uh, an economy that or labor market that is already very informal to, I say, uh, another articulation of an informal economy. And one that to some extent is even more formalized than what came before. So I remember, for instance, a an, an presentation at, a, I think it was even a conference organized by ETUI last year. Um, on uh, the presentation was on domestic labor platforms in Mexico. Uh, so they interviewed domestic workers using uh, platforms to find families for which they could work and uh, what their opinions were about uh, these platforms. And one of the things they stressed was that compared to uh, the labor market before those platforms, now it was actually more regulated. Because previously they would find families to work for through family contacts, for instance, or through friends or uh, uh, being suggested by a friend to another friend, and um, which created quite some risks for issues like harassment. And, and also once you were harassed by uh, that family, for instance, uh, who could you complain to? No one, basically. Whereas once you had these uh, digital platforms organizing domestic labor, it was actually more regulated than before. Uh, so in those contexts, platforms often function as a force of regulation rather than deregulation. So indeed, the kind of story that I'm telling is quite specific to, I would even say, particularly the European context. Because the US as well, you notice that there uh, um, um, labor markets are already also quite informal compared to European labor markets. And, um, and, and on many types of workers. And I would like to also bring here a question from Martin on vulnerable workers. Uh, the problem with a platform called Helping was not that their business model, mm. uh, but the problem that it complete, uh, competed with informal market mm. uh, costs after the verdict it needed to compete with formal market costs with informal market prices. Mm. Uh, in his opinion, the case of helping shows that the most precarious workers are still ignored in the public debate, also by policymakers and trade unions. Mm. That's Martin. Mm. What is your opinion about that? Yeah. Well, to some extent, I agree. Yeah. So, so, I've, I've, so, we've had this this discussion. Also with the the Dutch uh, labor union, specifically about the case of Helpling, because the Dutch labor union said, uh, "Well, if those companies are unable to pay their workers proper wages and uh, to secure proper social protections, then they shouldn't be in our labor market in the first place." And so that was that. Uh, so they said, "Well, this bankruptcy is a good uh, is a good development." And I remember Martin, but also me disagreeing with this. Because exactly what you see is that these workers were not exactly helped by this bankruptcy. And they would very often uh, move back to the informal domestic uh, labor sector. And uh, they would, uh, or, or move to unemployment instead. And so hence why I think that this idea of cooperative platforms could function as a kind of social safety net here where you can say, well, if, if those are indeed unethical companies that we don't want in our labor market, then we should be able to offer another ethical alternative to it. And so we need to invest in these cooperative platforms. Tim, before I ask more questions on cooperative uh, on cooperativism, um, <laughs> here Thomas Nagel asks, will there be strict obser observation of minimum wages also on platforms? Again, um, depends also on how you will calculate, calculate those wages. So for instance, one of my questions, and I don't know what, how this will be exactly um, regulated in the platform work directive, concerns unpaid labor time. Uh, so the time in between tasks. So that you are supposed to, for instance, you're driving for Uber, uh, but kind of in between two rides, 
and you are driving around waiting for a client, will that be paid time or not? Uh, because if not, then it could be that if you actually start calculating the amount of hours you work, you will still end up below minimum wage. Uh, but so I don't know what's in the platform work directive specifically about that. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious myself to know. We will discover it in a few days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Going to your proposal on cooperativism team, yeah. uh, Victor is asking, how does the cooperativism model function with workers who see their participation in taxi work or food delivery just as a temporary job in a transition towards something different? Yes. Uh, indeed. Eh? So you notice that quite a lot of workers, uh, say the motivation to start with this work is indeed they see it as a stepping stone towards something else. Um, to some extent, what you do notice is that quite a lot of these workers don't actually find this kind of better job afterwards, but actually end up moving from one gig to another. And so it might actually be a good case to start thinking of this as more permanent work but then should have better conditions as well. Uh, so that's uh, one route to think about it. Uh, in that way, kind of changing the mentality or the motivation to start this kind of work. Um, on the other hand, still, even if you say, well, this will only be temporary work, then indeed the, the, the emotional investment to uh, spend time organizing this, governing this will be lower. But there are mechanisms to also make the transaction costs for this kind of bottom-up democracy lower. And so there are ways of organizing, for instance, uh, communication platforms through which you can deliberate on how to organize a, a, a company relatively easily. And so for instance, a case I'm now thinking of is with um, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, another platform was developed called Dynamo, through which then workers can deliberate on what forms of collective action to pursue. And because here they have the same problems uh, with workers and uh, not uh, seeing Amazon Mechanical Turk as a job or as a, a permanent job or a long-term job. And yet these sorts of platforms seem to function rather well. Uh, so um, maybe we should then think about, say, lowering the transaction costs of these forms of government. Right. And on the model, I'm still on the model of platform cooperativism. No. So uh, Roni asks if these plat these cooperatives are uh, worker owned, and no. if their services are at their competitive rate, no. for example, meaning that customers pay the price required to cover costs for at least no. a living wage. So social security rates and etc. Yeah. What is your thought? What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. So are they worker owned or not? So that will very much depend. Uh, so I think in the case of um, uh, co-op cycle and this kind of things, it's uh, they, they think of it as worker owned. You have other cases where, for instance, the consumers are also owners of the cooperative. Think here of Signalize, which is a cooperative for uh, interpreting services for deaf people. And so here uh, the owners are both the interpreters, but also the consumers using these services. Um, so that's another option to go for. Uh, or you could, for instance, think of municipally organized cooperatives where the municipal government still has a say in, in those uh, cooperatives as well. And because you also want to make sure that once you have this worker-owned cooperative, that it doesn't start uh, um, Kind of abusing or exploiting its consumers uh, uh, by uh, taxing uh, monopoly rents or these kind of things. And so, hence, uh, we should think of it more kind of user owned or worker owned, or depending a bit on the particular co op we're talking about. Um, now I have to think what was the second part of the question again? Uh, I can't find oh, the, the services. Um, I. Oh. Oh, Roni, if you're still there, can you please um, read your second question, please? Because I uh, take on the Don box. Uh, ah. In the meantime, let's take a question from Rolf Jager here. Uh, how 
big question is how trade unions would need to change to be attractive for gig workers. What would be the biggest challenge for this? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I think kind of also on the one hand, you notice that kind of the campaign for employment status works with some workers, but not with with uh, a quite large group of those workers. What seems to function a bit better is like offering these very concrete uh, forms of immediate help or immediate support, because you notice that one of the big frustrations of gig workers with their quasi employers and the platforms is that they don't have kind of a human manager to talk to anymore once there's an issue or a problem. Uh, a, a customer refuses to pay or, or a payment doesn't come through through some kind of algorithmic mistake. Um, or uh, they don't know what to do in a particular case. They don't have a manager to talk to and to help them. And from what I hear, at least, is that the cases where unions are able to connect to workers is when they offer that kind of support. Uh, so, so helping them with very concrete things about how to coordinate their work. And it's then once you have established that kind of rapport, uh, then you have a kind of a point of connection. Now, another obstacle that I've recently heard about, but again, my evidence is indirect uh, or anecdotal, so to speak, is that what you see often happening is that you have kind of bottom-up organization of uh, gig workers, trade unions offer their support eh, because they are supportive of this. And, and then what happens is that these individuals who do most of the work in this self-organization then end up moving towards the trade union and no longer actually performing the, the, the work itself. And so I've, I've heard of a couple of cases of this because indeed, in terms of career trajectory, it could be seen that for the individual, it's quite attractive uh, to move out of your platform work or gig work towards uh, some kind of trade union uh, organizational job instead. Uh, so this is a risk. I don't have answers here, <laughs> but this is a risk to be, to be conscious of. Right. And on the same tone, Rolf asked also the anti-power the, the anti-power development seems to be difficult due to the centralized worker structure. Uh, these demands for new forms of trade union organization. Could yeah. local negotiation pools be an option? Maybe. Um, I'm not an expert. To be honest, I'm, I'm, I say this is I mean, a very disappointing answer, but I'm not an expert on, 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 on that, so I wouldn't be able to... Um, give a very good answer on this i can speculate but so we need to bring some trade union experts on organizing and they will be also yes. having a <laughs> i think that uh team we we are almost closing here but i would like to ask our audience if you have more specific questions to team you have a lot of comments and and greetings from from academics and from all the audience here also mm -hmm. there is a very interesting um, contribution for Elmar saying that there is a minimum wage um, directive, the directive on adequate minimum wage that explicitly mentions that platform workers can fall within the scope of that directive. Mm -hmm. And that statement is in the recital number 21 and oh, nice. in its place here. So that's a very Good. important resource. To, to I'm going to click on the link so that I make sure that I have it. Exactly. <laughs> Ronnie said that his question was perfectly uh, answered and mm -hmm. uh, and well Frank Pot is thanking you very much from the Netherlands also as a sociologist he thinks he he very much appreciates that you add control over the labor process into terms uh, of employment and um, well you can ah, chapter 15 of capital that is the chapter I got the quote from <laughs> <laughs> I think he's referring to to that. Yes. Um, and um, just a final comment for 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 uh, 
for well just a final refresh refreshing question from Wolf. His question is on trade union months. Where were my questions on trade union months were more directed to the audience. Thanks a lot for this very interesting insight. And uh, Sandro says that I hope no workers have to endure the difficulties of platform workers. But uh, Tim, if you would like to close this very interesting webinar with uh, some thoughts, extra thoughts, please welcome while we... Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for their, their uh, uh, excellent questions. Uh, I hope I've given a somewhat, uh, say, sufficient or, or, or uh, good response to them. Um, but if if any of you have more questions, or, um, um, I mean, you can email me. Probably if you e uh, if you type in my name, uh, you can uh, find my my email address online. So I'd say on that note. Super. Thank you so much. And uh, this takes us to uh, the end of our AI talk here at ETUI, the last of the year. Thank you, Team Christians, for this very engaging and soft, uh, uh, soft talk in a way. And thank you, the audience, for your questions and your engagement. See you next year for with more AI talks. Have a great day. Thank you and goodbye. All right. Thank you.